This week on the Angus Report, we discuss the pros and cons of sex semen, hear about haplotype testing, discuss mental health in rural communities, and we meet Daniel McFarland, a beef advocate at Johns Hopkins Medical Institute. This is the Angus Report. Hello and welcome to the Angus Report. I'm Rachel Robinson. George Perry, a professor and beef reproduction extension specialist at South Dakota State University, spoke at the 2019 Beef Improvement Federation Research Symposium on advancements with sexed semen. To actually be able to skew semen, uh, whichever method it is, we have to be able to separate the X-bearing sperm from the Y-bearing sperm. And so with the X-bearing sperm, we get female calves, the Y-bearing sperm, we get male calves. And one of the reason it works in cattle is because the X chromosome is larger than the Y chromosome. And when we look at the overall DNA content of a sperm, the X chromosome adds about 3.8% more DNA. And so we're able to stain it with a fluorescent dye and those sperm will actually fluoresce brighter and be able to sort the sperm between X and Y bearing sperm. So when we think about how we practically used sex semen in the industry, the first question really becomes what is the goal of the herd? If the goal of the herd is to produce terminal calves and they want high quality beef, high growth, they're going to breed to Y sorted sperm to actually produce male calves because then they can come in and market more beef on that's going to be faster growing and more efficient that way. But at the same time, we have just as many operations that are, have good genetics in their herd that are producing replacement heifers for themselves and also selling replacement heifers to other operations. And so the goal of their operation really might be to produce more replacement heifers. And so then their goal is going to be to produce, use uh, exported semen to produce more female calves. Low conception rates associated with the sex semen has historically scared beef producers away from adopting it. But Perry notes the strides that have been made and how producers might incorporate it into their breeding programs. When we look at where we are now, when we use it on cows that have shown estrus, we're actually pushing 90% of conventional semen. And so the technologies on sorting it or with the ABS gender ablation method, uh, Sexel, both of those methods, we're pushing that 90% of conventional semen. And so people have figured out how to make it less stressful on the semen to get those better conception rates. And so now instead of a 30 or 40% reduction, we're at 10% below conventional. So what that means is if we're running a 60% conception rate with conventional semen, 90% of it's 54%. And so it's not really a 10 percentage points it's really a 10% reduction, or in that situation, only 6% lower. And so when you get that close, people really start looking at it, and on 100 calves, that's really only a six calf difference. New sorting methods, reduced handling impacts, better conception rates. With all that in mind, Perry justifies the cost effectiveness of using the technology. When we look back over an eight year period from 2008 to 2016, the cost of a straw of semen only went up about 23% from about 17 to $24. But when we look at the average price of a bull, it went up from about 3,000 to almost $5,000, so about a 65% increase. Well, when you take that cost of a bull and divide it by the number of cows that he's gonna successfully breed, and the average lifespan of a bull is about four years, we see that the cost for each calf that bull produced just goes up each year. And so the ability to go in and AI and get genetically proven sires into your herd to get that genetic improvement versus buying a bull and spending that much money for someone that, yes, the EPD say will be good, but has not been proven, it really has driven the industry to look at AI more and to be able to utilize it. How exactly can sex semen impact the future of the industry? Perry explains. One of the things we have to think about and we hear all the time is the global challenge or the grand challenge. How are we going to feed the world in the next 50 years? And so when we think about efficiency of production, when we're producing pounds of beef, 
the steer calf is more efficient at producing more pounds of beef. And so when we look at globally, how can we implement this and produce more pounds of beef on the footprint we have, it is really one of those technologies that is going to allow us to actually move things forward and focus the industry to get more efficiency into it. Stay tuned, we'll be back with more Angus Report after a break. Welcome back. Research derived from haplotype testing is now being used to assist in identifying new recessive disorders to track the carrier status of a genotyped animal. John Cole, the acting research geneticist at the Animal Genomics and Improvement Laboratory at the USDA discusses the use of this research. Across the 30 chromosomes, there are 80,000 markers. And what we do is we break each chromosome up into 100 marker windows. So, so that's what we're calling the haplotype, is this block of DNA that, that's, um, that's got these 100 markers on it. So if, uh, if, if a, a chromosome were, uh, if there were 1,000 SNPs on the chromosome, there would be 10 of these haplotypes that are all lined up next to each other. So that's what we're looking for when we look to see if we ever see two of the homozygotes pairing up together. We then take our fertility data that come in from the field. So for example, in dairy, that would be things like heifer conception rate and cow conception rate. And we then do a statistical test to see if there's a difference in fertility between the animals that have a copy of the undesirable haplotype. We compare those to animals that don't carry a copy of the undesirable haplotype. And so uh, in addition to not seeing something that we expect to see, we also look to see if there's a measurable difference in fertility between the two groups of animals. When we never see those in the population, but there have been matings of animals, of carrier bulls to carrier cows, we start to say, well, why do we not see those in the population? And our, our initial suspicion is that when you get two copies of the mutation, that causes um, loss of a pregnancy, and that's why the animals with those genotypes are never born. Now that this information is available, how might a producer deem it useful to their herd? Cole explains. So what we think that we can do is we can share with, uh, with the folks at Angus and other breeds what we've learned about how to identify these uh, haplotypes that are harmful, ways of validating that the effects are real, and then we can also share with the folks in, in the beef sector what we recommend farmers do. So for example, we publish the status of the bulls, we, we suggest, uh, or I suggest, there's not universal agreement that you avoid carrier to carrier matings um, whenever possible. And in, in fact, um, in discussion with some of the uh, sire analysts, at least some of the AI companies simply prefer to not purchase uh, bull calves or embryos that are known carriers. And so that's another way of getting around the problem is you simply don't have them in the population in the new bulls anymore uh, anyway. Just because an animal possesses one genetic defect, that doesn't necessarily indicate that it would have multiple. A couple of years ago, we did a study that we published in the Journal of Dairy Science. As you would expect, most of the animals did not carry any known genetic disorders. A moderate number carried one genetic disease. There were a few animals that carried two undesirable haplotypes. And uh, there was one unfortunate individual who carried uh, five, I believe, five different undesirable haplotypes. In addition to tracking what we would call genetic diseases, we can also track desirable things like the polled haplotype, some of the coat color phenotypes as well. So we're talking here principally about genetic diseases, but this technology can also be used for other things. This technology suggests another variable to consider when making breeding decisions. We start sending out the carrier status of every genotyped animal uh, in the files, so the, the cow owners get the information back for their females, and then the bull owners also get that information and it's published in the sire catalogs and on the websites for the, uh, for the AI companies. So that information is there when you're considering a mating. 
so that you can avoid a mating of two carriers. Or you could even decide that you're not going to use a bull at all that's a carrier of an undesirable haplotype. For more information, visit AIPL.ARSUSDA.gov. We check in now on the latest cattle market news with the Cattle Facts Update. Hello, and welcome to the Cattle Facts Update. I'm Troy Bockelman. Beef exports have underperformed relative to expectations so far this year. Now down 2.7% through July after three years of double digit increases. South Korea was the main driver in the increase in beef exports a year ago, with nearly 40% growth in exports to this Asian market. South Korea is currently up 11% as growth has slowed and another usually strong market, Japan, is showing a 6% decline as the CPTPP countries have increased market share into this Asian country. Yet there has been a recent announcement that an agreement in principle has been reached and is expected to be signed by the US and Japan. This would reduce the tariffs on US beef around 12%, which would place the US on an equal tariff level with other CPTPP members. Large slaughter levels in Canada has been met with decreased beef shipments north and increased beef imports from Canada. Mexico continues to be a strong trade partner, up 2% through July. Yet the main driver in the decrease in exports has been Hong Kong, down 33% year to date. Current expectations are for U.S. beef imports to be steady with the year ago, while beef exports are forecast to finish the year down 2%. Pork exports are up 2% through July. But with China battling African swine fever, the potential for pork exports to finish the year up 10% or more is likely. Speaking of China, in July, pork exports to China were heavy at 110 million pounds. This is compared to 19 million pounds a year ago. And this was the biggest single month since November of 2011. As African swine fever continues to spread throughout Asia and Eastern Europe, increased pork exports are expected, which will likely support the hog and pork market in the fourth quarter at a time of record pork production. Total beef, pork, and poultry exports are now up 1% or 88 million pounds. It'll be important to continue to watch exports per protein, as well as in total, to determine the available supplies on the U.S. market as supply and demand will determine the underlying prices. For the Angus Report and Cattle Facts, I'm Troy Bockelman. To learn more about Cattle Facts, your leading source for beef industry market information, visit cattlefacts.com. Next on the Angus Report, we talk about mental health in the rural population. Stay with us. Welcome back. The stigma associated with mental health is evident in urban populations, but it's even stronger in rural areas. According to AgriSafe Network, 60 to 80 percent of visits to healthcare providers in the U.S. are related to stress, and almost 20 percent of those people live in rural areas. Today, Charlotte Halverson, clinical director at AgriSafe Network, discusses brain health specific to those who don't work a nine to five job and happen to spend most of their time in a tractor or on a horse. We have had a dramatic increase in the rates of death by suicide uh, in rural communities uh, over urban communities. And that doesn't mean that there are more deaths by suicide, but it, it indicates that the the percentages have skyrocketed. We know that the percentage of death by suicide in the last couple of years in the United States and rural communities has increased by almost 20 percent. Ranchers and farmers in this country are successful with what they do a lot because of their, their personalities and their perseverance and their work ethic. And they really feel that they have to take care of themselves and everybody else and that they're very stoic personality primarily, and that's great, and that's what's made them successful, but um, that's also what sometimes becomes a real barrier for them. Mental health care is, is just as important as, as taking care of your, your lungs or your bones or anything else. It's, 
it's your brain and your brain is an organ in your body and sometimes it needs a little fixing. Some of our uh, producers, particularly our dairy farmers, uh, for the last three, four years have been experiencing uh, a lot of uh, financial stress in agriculture because of the uh, commodity prices. Obviously, uh, one of the biggest areas that we've seen uh, impacting mental health, uh, particularly in some parts of this country, are weather-related issues. Uh, we've had uh, communities that have been devastated by wildfires in the last year, to year and a half. We have areas just recently that have been impacted by flooding, and the uh, results of that are not going to go away. They're going to be here for a long time. The recovery is going to take years. I, I think we're just kind of seeing the tip of the iceberg, actually. I think the next couple of years we're going to see a huge rise in mental health issues from the stress of agriculture. If you or your uh, family member or friend or neighbor uh, all of a sudden are experiencing and exhibiting symptoms of uh, high anxiety where they're just worried all the time and they can't seem to get a grip on it for in a period of over two weeks, then there's something going on. Uh, all of us have anxiety issues, stress levels, where for a day or two we just, you know, it's just totally makes us almost unable to function. Um, and, and that's kind of a normal reaction. But if it goes on for several weeks, then there, there really is an issue. And if people uh, are noticing that you, that, that I am having um, a struggle with some of those things, then please talk to me about it. Some of the signs and symptoms of, of uh, a major depression would be uh, inability to sleep, or sleeping all the time, a uh, major change in diet habit, a uh, major change in uh, their consumption of alcohol, not paying attention to things like bill paying, uh, maybe someone that is keeping up their farm and is very, very good about it is things are just not looking as neat as they always are. Uh, in conversation, they're becoming very defensive or not wanting to talk to anybody at all. Um, anger management becomes an issue, kind of shying away from their normal community social groups, whether that be a card club or a church or a membership organization. We are worried about these things, not just in our male farming, ranching population, but with our women, with our kids, with our teenagers. Uh, if teachers see kids not responding in class and school uh, and social activities the way they normally would, that's a red flag. There really is not that understanding of what it takes emotionally, physically, uh, financially to run and sustain a quality farm and ranch. And I, I wish that more people in America really understood that because I think then there would be more support for what uh, our farmers and ranchers are going through right now. If you or a loved one are struggling with anxiety or depression, visit agrisafe.org. If you know of someone contemplating taking their life, call 1-800-SUICIDE. Up next, we hear about an Angus success story. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Angus Report. A goal without a plan is just a dream. Luckily for past green coat Daniel McFarland, he worked hard but also dreamed big. Today, McFarland works as an administrative fellow at Johns Hopkins Medical Institute and attributes much of his success to the support of the Angus Foundation and the programs offered by the National Junior Angus Association. My name is Daniel McFarland. I am originally from Keithville, Louisiana, and I am currently an administrative fellow at Johns Hopkins Medicine. So I grew up in Keithville, Louisiana. I had three siblings and there was, two, there was three boys and one girl and all of us planned to be physicians at one point. My dad is a family practice physician. My mom was a stay-at-home mom that ended up supporting all of us and ensuring that we had everything that we needed to be successful. But all of us wanted to continue to pursue my dad's dream of having four kids that ended up becoming physicians. 
So I went into undergraduate with the idea of acquiring a medical degree to eventually go on to become a clinician. And so with that time hit, and um, I decided that I didn't want to go to school for another 10 years. So I decided to get into healthcare administration. Growing up, my dad always said that he wanted his kids to have a better life than what he had. And so with that, his upbringing included a small farm with a few animals, and he always said he wanted his kids to grow up on a larger farm to ensure that his kids were grounded and knew what hard work looked like. So at a young age, you had to assume a certain work ethic, and something that my parents always instilled, instilled in me, and it's, it's actually a biblical reference, is if you stay consistently true to the small things and the big things, whenever they're handed to you, you know how to deal with them, and also you know how to shine in those type of moments. So my dad, he didn't buy incredible cattle for us whenever we first started. He wanted to ensure that we worked really hard and that we understood that this is our project, this is something that we need to take care of. And then whatever ribbon that we got, if we didn't get the, the purple ribbon, it isn't that we were complacent. It was a matter of, of understanding that you did your best. So I think the National Junior, Ang Junior Angus Association did something for me that I didn't realize until later on in life. And it's, you're not gonna win everything, but if you do lose, learn from that loss and also find opportunities to make yourself a better individual. So if you would have met me when I was nine years old, I was a gregarious individual, but I wasn't um, incredibly social with people that I didn't know. I was nervous to see how I was, how I was gonna be accepted, considering that I was a little boy from Louisiana, and I didn't know all these people. And with that, I look back on my experience in Angus, and I laugh at, at that little boy that was so nervous and that was scared about uh, getting involved in Angus. I was on the National Junior Angus Association Board of Directors, and my second year I had the opportunity to be the Vice Chairman. And along with that, um, because of the Angus Foundation, I received undergraduate and grad, grad school scholarships. Fast forward to uh, whenever I went to the University of Arkansas my freshman year, I only knew three people, I think, when I first moved there. Dissimilar from that little boy that started in Angus, I knew how to make new friendships. My junior year in college, I actually ran for the student body president of, of the University of Arkansas. Along the campaign trail, I needed donations, and that various members of the Angus industry, they donated into my campaign funds. Whenever I was elected, I will never forget the amount of support that I had from all of my Angus family and my Angus friends. When I look back on my experiences so far in life, I think that the Angus Foundation had a significant impact on not only my personal growth, but also my professional growth. And I look back at the Raising the Bar conferences that the Foundation supported, the LEAD conferences, the National Junior Angus shows. And then um, if we move on to the academic support of providing scholarships for juniors all across the nation, that foundation has had a significant impact on, a, on so many people's lives. And when I look back at my own personal life, I wouldn't be who I am today if it wasn't because of the investment that the foundation has made in me and also that the investment that the association has as well. Angus has been intertwined in so many different components of my life and I would be remiss if I didn't say thank you for the investments that you've uh, provided for me and my family it has truly resonated well with me and I hope to do the same in the future. With the help of Angus-funded scholarships, Daniel was able to reach his educational goals. Congratulations, Daniel. And that's a wrap for this week's Angus Report. Tune in next week for another episode. And we have some exciting news. To keep up with the digital trends, we will be expanding our online educational resources. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Angus TV, to stay updated. See you next week.